Um, I'm Luke Merrick with uh, Fiddler Labs, I'm a data scientist there, and I'm going to be talking here a little bit about feature importance. Hopefully I can share some interesting uh, perspectives and summarize some pros and cons about different techniques uh, in the field. So jumping in, uh, the goal of this beginning and slide is uh, first to have a little bit of humor, and then secondly to realize that uh, sadly the, the humor is not really that wrong, and, uh, and then kind of have an epiphany that maybe it's okay. So in data science, we say we spend most of our time, you know, preparing the data and doing all this boring cleaning work, and then you know, maybe as a big data bore, I put it, we spend the other 20% of our time complaining. Um, ad additionally, we often cite this XKCD comic, um, showing that we're basically just chucking everything into pre-existing, complicated math that we don't necessarily understand deeply, and then just hoping the answers to the other side uh, come out okay. Um, now here, though, these are kind of two sides of one coin. Maybe. And, and bear with me a little bit. Uh, laziness and this uh, just funnel and, and pile of linear algebra is actually a solution to our first problem. And um, you know, I, I would say that this is not the most wrong way to put it. Uh, it's not necessarily correct, but if we just pour all our data into pre-existing tools that uh, people have already worked out the math for, and then we see what comes out, uh, based on that output, we can then stir it, iterate, uh, more effectively than perhaps if we took all the time to kind of um, go about our data from first principles at the beginning. Um, and so this leads us to the actual solution, which is going to keep all of our good analysis approaches and uh, exploratory data analysis, but accelerate and enrich it by um, kind of throwing things into a few algorithms here and there and, and looking at the results in a more uh, fast-paced, uh, iterative matter, manner. So um, kind of philosophical motivation aside, uh, let's get into the different types of feature importance and uh, how we can use them and why. Um, today I'm going to cover a few kind of what I consider core techniques and uh, I group these because they all look at how the performance of a model is affected by um, removing or, or modifying the, the inputs um, on a feature by feature basis. Um, I'm going to also cover a few variations of these core techniques but um, primarily we're going to talk about feature importance via permutations, uh, leave one out retraining, and then also a nod to some of the built-in um, feature importance measures that are specific to certain models but often uh, quite popular. Um, in terms of variations, I think these are this is where the talk will hopefully go a little bit past what's kind of uh, out there in common in some of these aggregated or intro tutorials. Um, and really talk about something that you know we've really uh, found important at Fiddler that doesn't maybe get enough uh, attention. And so here uh, we're going to talk about prediction sensitivity versus performance sensitivity, and then also looking at uh, slices, which are subsets of our data set that we can uh, kind of hone in on, um, especially outside the context of just maximizing model performance, but in the context of looking at kind of uh, more holistically how we can use feature importance. The basic idea here, if you haven't encountered it before, is that we're gonna go through all the features that we're thinking of putting in our model, that we have put in our model, and we're gonna do two things. We're gonna prevent the model from using that feature, um, and then we're gonna compute uh, how much that prevention decreases the model's performance, uh, accuracy score, or however you're measuring it. Um, and then we just simply compare across all features, and that, that gives us something like the plot on the right. Here we're looking, uh, this data set is, I believe, house price uh, prediction uh, based on features about the house and we can see uh, the nice thing about having very semantically meaningful features here is that we can actually compare against our intuition and say oh, yes you know the number of cars that fit in the garage is much less important than the overall quality of the home uh, in terms of its, its value and so we would expect a model to pick up on that and we are happy that you know this intuition is matched. Um, likewise this is actually a great way to catch things like label leakage where you find a graph if you have one when you kind of uh, unsuspecting, you know, not that meaningful feature taking all the importance, maybe that feature is somehow you leaked the label into it. And so you can kind of catch some of that here without needing to do a bunch of kind of manual sniffing through your data and, and um, verification. Though, disclaimer, this is not a replacement for that. So, um, first off, my favorite, Fiddler's favorite, permutation feature importance. It's kind of, uh, has a, a couple nice properties I'll get into. Um, uh, for doing this feature importance, but the, the basic idea is we take a model that exists and uh, rather than messing with the model, we mess with its inputs. So we scramble each feature one at a time and that's how we prevent the model from using that feature uh, effectively. Uh, and so visually this looks uh, as the following. 
uh, we're going to take some input data and some reference data. And uh, typically, this is uh, most simply done with the same data set twice. Uh, you can use your training data set, your testing data set, whatever data you have around. You can use a subsample. Um, all, all of these things are kind of valid choices. And uh, I have a couple of references for those who want to get more into the nitty gritty of, of how to make some of these choices. But um, what you do is you're going to take your input data and lay it out. And then you're going to take your reference data and perform random sampling on a single column at a time. And you're going to do random draws from that uh, reference data and replace the value you have in your input data with it without changing any of the other features or the label. And so what you get for your new input data is going to look like this. And also note that we are doing multiple draws per uh, row of input data as kind of a, a reducing the noise because you know one replacement may not have the same effect as different replacements. So averaging over a bunch of different replacements and a bunch of different inputs, we can kind of decrease the noise. And uh, that's actually why we at Fiddler often use the phrase random ablation because we're kind of ablating the feature with a random draw, uh, replacing it rather than permutation because that kind of suggests you're you're simply taking the inputs and then just shuffling the order, which would um, one, limit you to using the same data set, and two, limit you to one per run replacement per row, which might give you a noisy measurement. So here um, are the pros and cons of permutation importance as, as I see them. This is maybe not a complete list, but here are some of the, the key things to keep in mind. So um, like I mentioned, one of our favorites because it works with any model and requires no retraining. So it's, it's fast and uh, non-restrictive. You can also use different types of data sets. Um, I haven't linked it here, sorry, but uh, Chris, Christoph Molnar's uh, explainable ML book uh, has a great uh, sort of mini chapter on this uh, very question um, of whether you want to use your training data or your testing data. You can kind of get two perspectives. You can get you can run them both, look at both because it's fast, and you sort of see what the model fit to versus what uh, actually drives its out of sample performance, which is hopefully what you're trying to optimize uh, in the long run. Um, you know there are some drawbacks here. So one is a random algorithm. Like I said, uh, we do random ablations and do multiple ones, and uh, you know we we find that averages out the noise. We also have kind of an article and a technical write up on on how to actually compute confidence intervals when you do that and when you do a bunch of these repetitions. Um, but you know, do keep in mind that if you run with a different set, different permutations may give you different measurements, and you want to make sure that uh, you're not just looking at noise. Um, similarly, the model sensitivity to a permutation may not uh, relate exactly to predictive value. And I'll get into more on that uh, when we compare this against leave one out retraining feature importance. But uh, one thing to keep in mind is when you have highly correlated features, you know maybe your model only needs to use one of them. And so the other one, your model becomes completely insensitive to, even though it's just as predictive as the first one. And so that's a, you know, a gotcha to keep in mind uh, as you're using this technique. So there's a slower option here that sort of, uh, maybe thought of as a great solution to that problem of uh, when you have correlated features. Basically, rather than uh, permuting your inputs, you keep your inputs the same, but you kind of expensively retrain your model on every possible subset that leaves one feature out. Um, and so uh, this can be a little bit slower uh, or a lot slower. If you have a lot of features, then you're gonna have to run training you know, n number of features times, potentially hundreds of thousands of times the cost of basic training. So for slow, tra slow to train models or a large um, number of features, like this can be prohibitively slow. Um, uh, it still works with any model and it's more tied to your kind of model optimization goal because you're looking directly at performance, you're changing something, you're seeing what that does to the actual performance you care about. Um, and so this can help pick out when maybe it's okay to drop a correlated feature, even though you know training the model with all the features makes the model very sensitive to that feature. Um, you know, another thing to keep in mind is even though you've now eliminated the noise of, of which permutation you do, if your training process itself is kind of vari variable, um, for example, changing the order of your features or changing your random seed might affect the performance score you get out. Uh, you should benchmark this and test it. So here I've kind of listed two, two workarounds to the cons. First, you can group features um, and kind of see which group of features has high importance and then drill down just on that group of high importance features, ignoring your low importance ones. Um, you can also look at um, a baseline for what you expect the training noise kind of, uh, you know, what just retraining with a slight perturbation of uh, column order or random seed will do to your 
score. And if you find that, you know, uh, leaving one out and retraining and changes your score just as much as leaving none out and retraining, then really you should not be looking at these scores as any type of meaningful information because um, you would just basically be looking at noise in that case. Then lastly, I'm going to close the kind of, you know, classic feature importance measures with um, potentially the most popular measure. And the reason I put this last is because it has some cons that we really want to be aware of. That said, I use this pretty much every time I use one of these types of models, random forest or gradient boosted trees, because it, it takes no additional compute costs. It's, it's computer as part of training, making it the fastest method. And it's built in typically one or two extra lines of code in my um, pipeline. Um, however, I would encourage people to invest a little bit more of their time coding using an open source package. Uh, I think scikit-learn is adding some of these like, permutation importance in, in recent versions, um, or and also compute time, uh, running more predictions or even running more retrainings because of the two cons here. So first, it's biased because it's measuring how the model's in-sample fit improves with each feature, which typically is not what we want to measure. We want to measure what helps the model's out-of-sample performance. Um, and unfortunately, because this is computed as part of training, it can't really use uh, test data, um, and it, or it doesn't use test data. Um, additionally, it kind of artificially inflates um, the importance of numerical features and high cardinality categorical features. There's a, a longer write-up here, I've linked below the second, but um, basically, because of the way that trees split, um, when you have more potential splits, which occur in high cardinality categorical features and numerical features, you can split more times on a feature and increase the total cumulative number of splits or cumulative gain just because you're allowed to split more times, not because that feature is more predictive. Um, and so you can get these two biases that make these, um, even though it's potentially a, a noiseless and, and clean solution, um, you know, you may not want to trust the values you have um, due to bias rather than noise there. So, um, you know, uh, another thing to you know, just keep this in mind, I would say if you have it available to you because you're using one of these models, uh, my personal advice would be look at it. <laughs> um, it never hurts to get another perspective, but don't uh, blindly trust it or use it as a replacement to one of these other kind of um, more robust methods. So lastly, I'm going to close with a couple of variations. Uh, thank you for just sitting with me if you're kind of already familiar with the previous and we're waiting for this. Um, this is kind of how we extend or use, use these techniques at Fiddler, um, less in the context of just driving up that performance number for a model and more in the context of understanding um, potential limitations or, or uh, kind of debugging a model. Um, here we are. So a first variation is going to be slicing the data set. So typically, uh, these methods call for using just your entire data set, either train or test or a random sample that's uniformly drawn from it. But instead, what we can do, and this is a screenshot from our product and how we do it, you can take a, a specific, you know, semantically meaningful subset of your data and use that for the performance metric computation. So here, we still may randomly ablate for doing permutation feature importance using reference data from the overall data set. Um, and that's another reason why we, we uh, invented another word besides the term permutation. And uh, for leave one out retraining, you're still going to want to retrain on your entire data set. But when it comes time to make that performance measurement or choose your input data, you're going to you know, slice down to some meaningful subset. And what this does is it lets you understand, um, you know, when you compare it against overall feature importance, uh, it lets you understand how things may differ in your model, what drives performance might change uh, for certain subsets of your data, and, and gives you a more kind of a nuanced understanding of your machine learning model in, in the context of its application. Um, so this is one thing you can do, and uh, this is not too hard. If you have a tool that computes feature importance, you can typically just slice your data set uh, and run it through, although the training may, you know, uh, if, it's, if it's truly boxed up end-to-end, -end, you may have some trouble with, with retraining or with uh, not wanting to slice your reference data set. Um, but that said, uh, it's a useful technique, and I encourage you all to try it. Variation two here um, is going to be looking at uh, predictive Sensitive, prediction sensitivity uh, rather than performance sensitivity. And this is pretty much only compatible with permutations. It's basically one of the techniques from this paper on uh, quantitative uh, input influences, um, which I've linked here on the right. But uh, typically in feature importance where we care about a performance score, but um, instead we can also look at just, you know, how's our model as a function mapping input to output sensitive to the inputs, even if it's, you know, sensitive change in output doesn't affect performance. So, um, you know, consider a case where maybe the model has learned a pattern that's overfit 
and doesn't hold true in general, your model's performance when you permute that input and then you, because it's learned that pattern, its output is permuted, that change may not actually affect the performance score so much, um, but it, it definitely will you know, impact your model's behavior and you may want to be aware of your model's sensitivity to that input. And so what we can do is um, run our same permute and predict steps, but then change the order of operations around a little bit here. And so we take our scores, our, our, sorry, our model outputs um, with no permutation, and then we take it with permutation, and then we take the difference between those predictions and the absolute value there, and then we average all of that. So we take the average absolute change in prediction when you uh, randomly ablate or change the input. Um, and so this gives us a view that has places less emphasis on the performance of our model, but gives us some insight into sensitivities that may not be reflected in the um, model performance score as strongly. Uh, another little benefit here is that if you have unlabeled data sets or slices or you know data that you you know you haven't gotten around to labeling or the the ground truth hasn't come around yet because of time, um, you can compute the score on it uh, and see and uh, you know potentially even look at uh, differences in the feature importance between the data you trained on and the data uh, you're encountering in the real world and see you know maybe things are changing over time and, and stuff like that. So um, this is another interesting technique. Uh, again. These are two variations that we found very helpful at Fiddler, and um, hopefully this information is helpful to you all.